Right, evening everybody. Um, welcome, as I said, welcome. Um, tonight, we have, I, I think we have a subject which is one which everybody is always curious about and wants to know about and is, is, a, is a very fascinating one. Um, the, uh, the subject of fire, I think, is one which, which interests us all and Every time we see smoke rising from the from the felt anywhere, I think it's something that we all look at and wonder what is going on. So this evening we have um, Navashni Govinda joining us from from Kruger. She's the senior manager of conservation um, conservation management. Sorry, um, she oversees the impl implementation of biodiversity and conservation programs rehabilitation, invasive species, resource use, etc., in the Kruger Park. So it sounds like she's a very busy lady. One of her responsibilities is using fire as a tool for ecosystem management, developing fire policies, implementation of fire plans, monitoring and decision support systems for KNP. She is also the co-chair of the Southern African Fire Network serves as the Fire Protection Officer for Greater Kruger Fire Protection Association and is a research associate at the Nelson Mandela University. She has over 20 years of experience as a savannah fire ecologist in South Africa, mainly burning in the Kruger National Park and with working on fire and expanded public works program in South Africa. So with that, Navashni, please turn on your video and over to you. Um, Hi, Peter. Can you hear me? Uh, here we go. Thank you. Welcome, Navashni. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, let's see if we can get the sharing going. So I need to first. Um, there we go. We can see it. You just need presentation mode. Okay, I've put it on presentation mode. Is that yep, good? Yep, we got it. Thank you. It's all yours, Navashi. Please go ahead. Okay. Oh, gosh. Okay. Let's... Okay. Good evening, everyone. I see there's a bit of timing on my slides. Apologies for that. So I may have to go back and forth. As Peter said, I am the um, senior man for conservation in the Kruger National Park, but I started in the park in 2001 and I started as the fire uh, technician. So I have a lot of experience working my way through with fire in Savannahs and the Kruger National Park. Thank you to the honorary rangers for giving me this opportunity to share the experiences and our learning and understanding about how we use fire in the Kruger National Park for management. So we titled the talk, Burning for Biodiversity, but actually we would also like to talk about fire as a necessary evil because very often fire is seen as an evil, but we need to understand that it is good for our ecosystem savannas. So we know that fire is a very necessary and a global phenomenon. And I like to show you this slide where it actually depicts that. It goes through the months and these are active detections from MODIS imagery. And you can see as the season moves, the fire's active detection also moves through, um, through the slide. And you can see fire in Africa it is the fire continent. It has the most amount of fires that take place. So fire takes place everywhere, but what difference is the seasons that's burn and the timings and then the vegetation type as well. So it is a global phenomenon. However, this is how most people see fire, something that is destructive, something that is uh, a disaster. But it's quite important to know that if your livelihoods are affected, why would you not see fire as a damaging infrastructure? But in the Kruger National Park, this is how we see fire, something that cleans the landscape, rejuvenates the landscape, provides fresh new grazing, allows the landscape to heal and to develop new growth, but also to use as a management tool so that we can convert wooded areas, that is bush encroached areas to more open landscapes, which we need. We know that fires or African savannas are complex and dynamic systems. They characterize by the co-dominance of trees, they are controlled by fluctuations in water, availability, nutrients, herbivory, and of course, fire. And fire is regarded as one of the key drivers in these systems. 
However, recently what we are seeing in our landscape is a phenomenon that is called the death of savannas. And what this means is that if you look at these fixed point photographs of these aerial images of landscapes in South Africa, like the first one in Shishlubi Amphilozi in 1956 and the next one in 2012, you can see the area has clearly shifted from a more open area to a much more wooded area. This is taking place in the drier areas in, in South Africa, like the Karoo, which is in 1900s, and then comparison in 2010, becoming a lot more wooded for that area. And the same in the Drakensberg. Now, reasons for this is always attributed to an increase in carbon, um, carbon dioxide, but also inappropriate land management, specifically that of fire suppression. When we look at the interaction between rainfall and fire, we see that in wet years, our herbivores cannot consume all the grasses, but in our, and therefore fire plays a role as a more generalist herbivore. You get more fires in your wet year. In our dry years, we have a lot less fuel production and fire can herbivores can consume a lot more of the grasses and therefore you have less fire. This is very counterintuitive. The more rain you have, the more grass you have, and the more fires you have. And this is one of the key relationships that we use in Kruger to determine how much we need to burn. I would like to show you some fixed point photographs about how fire can be used in the landscape and how differently it takes place. These are fixed point photographs in, in, the, in an area in the Kruger National Park. And if you look at this is 1985, follow the tree, this is 1995, this is 2005, and this is 2015. And you can see this area hasn't really changed. If you go to another landscape in the Kruger National Park, you see this is 1985, 1995, 2005, and 2015. And actually this area has become more open and fire is the tool that has been used to create this openness. But when you're burning in the Kruger National Park, you can't forget that of the interaction between herbivores and that is our elephants and our uh, grazers, the rhinos, and the influence that this interaction takes place and the influence that it has on fire patterns and the effects. So we know that elephants strip and remove bark from our live trees. They expose the cambium and, and the inner cavern is important for the transport of water and nutrients. And when we have successive fires, this can kill the trees from the inside. This is an example of two trees under the same fire, but if you look at the type of impact that is taking place. The, fire, the, the tree on the left-hand side has not much, hasn't got any elephant damage, but the tree on the right hand side has significant elephant damage and fire as a secondary impact will now have an imp will now be able to kill the tree from the inside. So when you're managing an area, you have to consider what happens with elephants and herbivory and then fire as the two dominant uh, drivers in the system. I like to look at this further in a 1950, in a 54 year management experiment disclosure where if you look at the background, you've got a fenced off area, that's the area in the white, and in the foreground is unfenced. So this is 1985, this is 1995, the picture is taken, uh, this is 2005, and now 2015. And what you can see in the background, because we've been able to keep elephants out of the system, and yet we still have the same fire regime in both areas, you can see the significant changes in the woody biomass that illustrates once again this interaction between these two dominant uh, drivers in savannas. If we now go on to a 67 year old fire experiment where you have the plot on your left hand side that has fire being implemented in it, a fire regime, and you still have elephants in there, and yet on the right hand side the plot does not receive fire and you still have access to herbivory, elephants specifically, but once again the woody biomass component is very different. So this just really reinforces that when you're managing a landscape, you can't manage just elephants or herbivory by themselves or fire by themselves. You have to have these two drivers interacting and overlap with the fire management policy because you see this very, very big interaction between these two drivers. When we look at rhinos and the herbivory that takes place, our rhinos are mega grazers. They really do play a role in creating these grazing lawns, these 
patches of short and long grasses, very distinctive habitats, microhabitats that we say of because they hold a different, they support a different suite of biodiversity and species. And these grazing lawns really do influence the fire patterns that we are seeing. So this also has to be taken into account. But we know that what we are experiencing is a decrease in our rhino population that, and that has significant effect in influencing the fire patterns. This is a figure of the number of rhinos in the Kruger National Park from the 1960s, and you can see it was slowly increasing up until 2000, where we saw a rapid increase in the numbers. And we know in about 2010, when poaching started, uh, our numbers are continuing to decrease. The investment into anti-poaching activities over the past 10 years has run into the billions of rands, and no more so that the honorary rangers that know this because you guys support us in our anti-poaching effects. But this is really at the expense to biodiversity conservation and very important, the range of social well-being and safety. So we've now decided to rethink the way we, the way we manage our rhinos or our anti-poaching is to now focus on the asset that is the rhinos start really guarding our rhinos to intensive monitoring. Then also focus on habitat management for improved forage quality and quantity. Meaning, try to, if we wanna have a healthy population, we need to improve numbers. And that means we need to provide good quality grazing and for our rhinos. Then invest into protecting our cows, but also invest in rhino conservation, but not just anti-poaching. But I would like to focus on the habitat management and how we can use fire to improve uh, the habitat for our, for our rhinos. Because we are seeing an, an increase in our woody habitat. And with the consequence of reduced fires, we are seeing a reduced woody habitat, increase in woody habitat. This leads to a decrease in forage quality and quantity, reduction in herbivores, predation, ecotourism in our parks, Finally, KNP and African savannas, and ultimately biodiversity. So, fire can be a tool to really move and to really um, open our habitat because this increase of our woody or bush encroachment is taking place. One thing I would like to talk about is also the legislation. If you want to have good fire policies and implementation, we need to have good legislation. Very often in many countries, um, setting fires is actually criminalized. And we need to have the support from the top and therefore national legislation needs to support the putting in of fires. In South Africa, our current legislation actually does not allow for prescribed burning except for fire breaks. So no prescribed burning except for fire breaks for safety and security reasons. We are currently in a process to amend this to allow for more prescribed burning for food fuel reduction and actually go to as far as allowing for more high intensity fires for ecological reasons. But as we know, this is a very long process, but it is a step in the right direction. Our legislation also supports fire protection associations. This has been an incredible tool or a mechanism or a vehicle to allow for different landowners to talk together and to come together uh, and discuss things around a common driver. However, what happens is when you form a fire protection association, you have to secure your boundary. You have to have trained staff felt uh, to fight or to manage fires in both the felt and infrastructure. You provide equipment and appropriate PPE, but ultimately you use, you are there to reduce the fire risk and support good fires. In the Kruger National Park, our policies, we've come a long way. We have a long implementation of fires in the Kruger National Park. I really do apologize because I'm not sure what's going on, but let's go on. Um, we, the fire policies that we have is uh, from about 1926 to 1947, we had a laissez-faire and those are the objectives. We were concerned about the negative effects of fires and we went through this protection phase in 48 and 56. Then there were almost three decades of really prescribed burning, one where we fix the frequency and the season, but then we try to actually reduce, um, to be more flexible our season, but we still had a fixed frequency in 1981 and 1991. In 1992, the whole wilderness philosophy really gripped the country as well as the world. And this was a period where we told our managers and our rangers to stop lighting fires and then it was only thought that lightning is the only dominant 
natural ignition source in the Kruger National Park. But when we evaluated the data from this era, we saw that actually there were more fires, more than 75% of the fires were actually started by another cause, which is usually man, other than lightning fires. So we then became, we realized that man is a very uh, important ignition source in the Kruger National Park. With that in mind and that learning, we in 2001 changed our fire policy to combine all ignition sources where during this time period, we allowed for um, a combination of all the dominant ignition stores. And that was our rangers, lightning, as well as people and tourists, you know, in the Kruger National Park, they did play a big role. However, we encouraged our rangers for them to set more fires and in order to determine how much we need to burn, we based that on rainfall and biomass. And we gave the responsibility to our fire managers, with our rangers to determine where and when and under what conditions, weather conditions to light these fires. We found that the rangers were not really setting as many fires as we wanted them to. So we decided to support them a bit more. Where we then said, we set out once again to determine how much we burn based on rainfall. But then we divided the park into various fire management zones. And then within these zones, we indicated what was the frequency and the intensity of burn that was required. And then we said the rangers could determine within a fire management zone where they could light, but they were directed in what the frequency and the intensity, intensity of the fire should be. We determined these, um, the fire management zones by overlaying the KNP rainfall map. And we know we have a good rainfall um, gradient. We use the geology, the granites and the basalts. And we also use the historical fire frequency data. We mapped all the fires from 1947 to about 2012. And we said, what is actually happening with fire in the Kruger National Park? And you can see the red areas are burning more frequently. There are some blue areas that uh, do not burn. And with that, we use these three layers to delineate our fire management zones. And we came up with five fire management zones. And there were specific ecological and um, management decisions to have fires in these zones. And as you can see, there are some zones where we would like to increase fires frequency and intensity. And these are in our, where the red arrows are. And there are actually some zones that we would like to decrease fire frequency and intensity. And you will also see that there are some so-called wilderness fire zones where historically no fires, or fire is not a, a very predominant driver in there. So if there is a fire in those zones, we will let them burn but management will not light any ecological fires in these no fire management zones. What's really important to understand, this is the first time that we've actually used the vegetation or an ecological requirement to determine how much we need to burn and why we need to burn. So that's quite important to, to remember that. Well, supporting evidence for these fire management zones and what we're actually doing, we know that management does not seem to have an influence in how much or an area that needs to burn. It is very strongly correlated to the previous two years rainfall. That's why we let how much rain has uh, fallen the previous two years and the biomass to dictate how much that needs to burn. It is also the fire return period is also driven by or influenced by the variability in rainfall. So these are the two elements of the fire regimes that managers historically we've shown that we cannot influence. So we let rainfall determine or guide us to how much we need to burn. But then, and we've shown this with this data, so we can see that the graph on the right, the A, is all the fires historically, and all these graphs, irrespective of what we as managers said we are going to do, the fixed burning re uh, regime, the lightning burning regime, and even the flexible burning regime, it was not managers controlling how much we need to burn. There was a very strong relationship by the slope of the graph with the preceding two, ra two years rainfall. So what can managers influence? And we know that with that, managers can influence the season of fire and the heterogeneity in fire patterns. And this we've shown when we looked at the changes in fire intensity. And what happened was that within these eras, we show a clear shift where we have the percentage of the area burnt and the different fire management eras, flexible, uh, sorry, fixed, flexible, and natural. And within these eras, we've seen a clear shift to more high intensity fires all the time. So it is actually we've shown with data that as managers, we can influence 
the intensity of the fire. And how do we do that? We burn in different seasons. We burn under different fuel moisture content conditions. We burn under different weather conditions. So that's how we can determine whether we want a cool fire or a hot fire. And if this is the element of the fire regime that we can influence, why not influence it? And that's what we are trying to do by having different fire intensities and frequencies in the different fire management zones. So when we burn our fires, there's a lot of monitoring that takes place. It's a legal and an ecological requirement for, for fires to be monitored. We have a reporting system, we have an information system, a mapping system, and a decision support system. And we continue to do this from 1947, and we still improved in our ways, but we still continue to map and record every single fire in the Kruger National Park. There is a reporting system, and as I said, the fires get reported by our rangers when they do ignite the fire. And our mapping system is as follows. We have some early mapping systems, uh, the graph in, on the left and the right. We have the ones where we started using our burn blocks, where we now got much more sophisticated, where we can detect fires as big as two football field size from motor satellite imagery. So we're getting much finer scale mapping. And that's very important for biodiversity. So not all um, elements of biodiversity need a, a single fire. They need variable fire regimes or pyrodiversity. So this particular tool modus allows us to map these fires over the time. We provide weather information. The weather rules our lives in the fire season, and we have a very good weather information network with that of the Hortec and the iLeaf system. We have 15 weather stations in the park, and we get temperature readings, daily weather, 10-day forecasts. We can calculate fire danger indices. And we now even have give access to the public to real-time KNP weather, which is really quite nice. But the weather really is very, very important when deciding the types of fires that we need. And the rangers do have access to this information. Other bits of information we provide is that of biomass, active detection through the AFA system, and even taking them to the uh, cell phone notification to our rangers. Very recently, as of the last few weeks, we would like to provide more public access to monthly KNP fire scars. Um, I've been answering a lot of emails about two questions. Can we notify people where we're going to burn so that they can plan their trips? And unfortunately, we cannot answer that. Uh, we cannot provide that information because it's left to the ranger to decide. So where they're going to burn and also then weather conditions. And then the other question, the request came from the public is, can we tell people where it has burnt or what areas in the park have has burnt? And we can definitely do that. So we're gonna try this out to provide this information to the public and you can look at the monthly scar patterns um, and we put it along with our tourist roads and our camps so that people know um, where the fire scars are. And hopefully the more information we have, the, uh, the tourists can plan their holidays and things. So what does the future hold for us with fire? We know that our climate is changing uh, and the effects of climate change on fire danger indices. We're getting more red days and therefore more uh, longer fire seasons. And this we've shown in with a looking at the, the temperature data that we got from um, in 19, comparing the 91-92 uh, temperature data as well to the 2015-2016 to data. And we can see that the number of days that were um, above 35 degrees in 1992 was 74 compared to 136 days in the recent drought. And that just means higher temperature, you've got higher fire danger indices. So that's taking place. We took this a bit further to try and look at the number of the days that were greater than 40 degrees. And you can see 1992 was seven and there were almost three times as much. So with higher fire danger indices, that means you're getting more red days and then hotter fires. So we need to pay attention to that. And how do we manage these fires when they burn under these conditions? What's happening with climate change and carbon sequestration and how does this uh, translate to the effects on fires? We have a lot of Western ideolog ideologies of reforestation and I'm not sure whether people have heard about the bond challenge, AFR 100, the UN tree, trillion tree campaign. These are all initiatives that are put and that Africa has bought into where we are doing restoration for carbon sequestration by planting trees. And what's really worrying about this is that these models predict that the Kruger National Park and areas like Serengeti are classed as degraded landscapes. 
and they need to be rehabilitated. So how do are we rehabilitating these lands? It's by planting trees. Second thing that's very boring is the type of trees that they are, these programs are advocating. These are rapid growing, growing eucalypts and pine trees. So I think we really need to look and be part of these debates that are taking place where we are getting these programs advocating that we need to plant these trees for carbon sequestration as well as for rehabilitation. And I think as Kruger National Parks, Sand Parks and South Africa, we have to be part of these debates. I mean, the benefits for these reforestation uh, program for global warming reduction is very poorly supported by science. However, the costs are quite extensive because they are extensive land transformation. The gains in carbon sequestration is very small. The biodiversity losses are not actually acknowledged and sometimes ignored. And then we get uh, the stream flow reduction and the resilience or loss of resilience in these ecosystems. So I think this is very important that we start playing a role in these debates and that's what we are currently doing. So the one thing I spoke about is that the species that these programs are advocating is that of um, eucalypts and pines. And we know that we've experienced it in Neisner and when we see these fires where there's an increase in fire frequency and intensity and out of season fires where you have these alien species like wattles and eucalypts and pines. There's a lot of loss of native vegetation, this increased soil erosion, and of course, the increasing threat to lives and property. So I think um, we really have to pay attention to these programs and what they are advocating. So in Kruger, in KNP, I would like to conclude that fires are indeed necessary. They are complex and their interactions with other drivers must be considered. I do say that, yes, we do have a lot of fires in Kruger, but it's not all bad and it is necessary. And most importantly, that the correct fires are really good for the ecology and the people in and around the area. KNP and our savannas, our flora and our fauna and the people have lived with, evolved with and managed fires for millions of years. And this is something that we really need to um, understand and advocate that the vegetation that we're seeing and the flora and the fauna has been fire adaptive and even to some extent fire dependent for their, uh, for their ecology. So I think we need to continue this. And I would like to say thank you because um, it was a real pleasure to give you the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Navashni. That was, there were a lot of facts in there. I don't know, I hope we managed to absorb a good number of them. Um, it, was, it was very interesting and, and amazing to see how much has been learned over the, over the years. Um, the uh, you you said something that re that was reinforced something that was said to a, in a in a meeting recently with Richard Sowry. We asked him why he'd spent so much time in the last few days burning, and he said, "There's so much grass. There's no way all these animals are going to eat it. So I have to burn it before we have a big fire." So you reinforced exactly that that sentiment is that if there's too much grass for the animals to eat. You have to do something with it before it causes too much damage. So yes. today I'm going to hand over to, to Vili to pose the, the questions to you. There are quite a few questions. Before Vili comes on, would you like to answer those few that came in via email? Yes, I would. I mean, there was an issue. There was a, um, a question about, you know, cool burning, if that is an option. And yes, that is an option. We have something called... Uh, high intensity fires or cooler fires and it seems a bit counterintuitive but you can manipulate how hot the fires burned by burning at different times of day burning in different seasons burning uh, under different fuel moisture contents so that's how you will manipulate or influence the fire intensity or how hot the fire burns um, i think the other question was how do you control uh, sickle bosch uh, boss or dicrostacus so yes, this is one of our indigenous encroaching species along with uh, Combretum in the Kruger National Park. But I know a lot of farmers are dealing with sickle bush. Um, this species actually, um, when it grows in dense stands, they outcompete the grasses and therefore you don't even get a good grass swab. So that's not good for your grazing um, game. What we are finding is that the general thinking to deal with this species was to burn it, burn, burn a hot fire. And when do you get a hot fire is in winter because the fuel conditions are drier. But we need to understand the life history of the species. 
This species in winter, it goes dormant. It pulls all its resources uh, underground. And therefore, when you put a, a fire in, you have an effect only on the above ground uh, mass of the vegetation, um, the structure, which is already dormant. And you don't have any effect on the actual resources, which is below ground. So yes, a hot fire is required to tackle the species or to have an effect on species, but it's better to have a hot fire in the growing season. And this is actually very difficult to do because in the growing season, your fuel is greener, your fuel is um, a lot wetter, so it's difficult to get a hot fire. But you need to really pay attention to, you know, ways in trying to get a hot fire so you can change your ignition pattern. So the ultimate thing is to get a hot fire in the growing season to tackle this uh, particular species. And we've been able to show that from data from the experimental burn plant where we looked at the densities of Diplostachys in the plots of the 1950s or 1950s, the original surveys, and looked at it over successive years. And we saw a decrease in the species, sickle bod, uh, Diplostachys scenario, in the, the growing season treatments, your December and your February treatments. So that's why we started looking at the life history of this particular species. Um, then the other question was about what happens to your tortoises and your smaller animals. So yes, we can't plan for, um, I mean, these species have evolved with fires, but they have evolved with cooler fires, more frequent patchy burns. But when you start suppressing fires, you let the fuel build up. And when you do get a fire, then it's a much a fire of a higher intensity. So the flora and fauna in savannas in the Kruger National Park has, have evolved with cooler, mm -hmm. uh, low intensity, frequent fires. But we need to now put these fires in to reduce, um, uh, to reduce the fuel load so that we can maintain this low intensity fire. So I think the smaller animals, they are able to burrow into grounds, hunker down, but it's only when you don't allow the low intensity fires that you will have an effect on these species. Um, yeah, I think that's about it, uh, Peter. Navashni, thank you. I'm going to now hand over to, to Vili, who's going to go through the questions that have been posed in the Q&A. So, Vili, your turn. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Peter. <clears throat> and thank you for every, uh, all our HRs that, uh, that registered for this extremely interesting uh, webinar. Navashni and I, uh, you know, I've received on uh, via Facebook, WhatsApp, and even in the, in the chat box, uh, so many compliments. Uh, for your presentation. Uh, they vary from uh, concise, factual, and very good, great webinar, absolutely uh, some good applause. This was awesome. Thank you from Jean and Sandra in the Pretoria region. So yes, many compliments. But uh, there are also uh, quite a few questions and some interesting ones at that. Uh, the first question I would like to pose uh, came from Jan Plasser, and he said he wasn't. Uh, he visited Kruger uh, National Park recently, and he was quite interested. Uh, or they, they experienced a very high incidence of fires whilst they were there. Uh, officials could not confirm whether all the fires were controlled or not, uh, and his question is: How often are fires started as an act of arson? In, in Kruger. Okay, so the reason why we're now seeing a lot of fires in this fire season, as I told you, the relationship is the more rain you have, the more biomass you have, the more fires you have. So we know we've had good rainfall the previous two seasons, and therefore this year, this fire season, we will have lots of burn. What we must always remember is if we don't set the fires, someone else is going to set it. And I always say that um, I like to is uh, William Bond puts it very nicely, is that we have the conditions. There are three switches you need for a fire. You need, good, you need the fuel, we have the fuel. You need the environmental conditions, we have that, uh, the hot, dry winters. And then unfortunately you need the idiot with the match. And we have lots of people running around. So we would like to be the people with the matches and control how, how these fires burn and the conditions that we burn. Other, otherwise, these fires will be lit under conditions that the rangers are not able to control because they will be lit under high FDI days. So 
we then uh, that's why you are seeing a lot of fires early in the fire season april may june july to kind of break up the fuel load to reduce the fuel to break up the fuel load reduce the fuel load um, reduce the fuel continuity so that when we do have the late season fires that their impact is a lot less than what we would have had if we had not put in those early season funds so early in the fire season we have a lot of fires set by our ranges in fact dominant 90 percent and that's what we do in terms of arson fires i will say that has significantly reduced over the years because our ranges are setting more fires and breaking up the fuel load but if we don't do that then there will be much more fires and we won't call it arson more fires set by other ignition sources other than our ranges so i hope that answers this question okay yeah thank you very much uh, navarsia i think uh, that was comprehensive and uh, you've you've certainly answered um, jan's question uh, another question from pete zack um, the question is maybe not uh, Uh, so applicable to Kruger, but he, he, his question is, when was prescribed burning stopped in South Africa? All provinces has burning regulations for felt management in the past. So the question is, when was prescribed burning stopped? Will you be able to answer that for us? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think really Kruger also uh, followed, you know, very much what's happening in the rest of the In, in, in the country and legislation wise. So I think it was the CARA Act where we said that really there was this perceived negative effect of fires on the soil. And that's when really our prescribed burning uh, really stopped. And that was in the early um, 50s and 60s that it did, or the late 50s and 60s, the early 60s that it did stop. We, we, we actually, in Kruger, we said there'll be no more burning and that went on for a, a few years. but. Over time, we then realized that there was this benefit to burning, and then we started developing the fire policy. So my understanding, it was came from legislation, and it was actually the soil uh, uh, legislation that really put a, uh, a stop on, on, on the fires. Uh, thank you very much, um, Navashni. I'm going to go to some questions that were posed on, on Facebook as well. Uh, one, one question uh, came from Chantal, and uh, her question is, you mentioned that there are areas where you will increase fires and areas where you will decrease fires. If I may ask, what is the reason for reducing fires in those areas? Okay, so, In areas in the park, the fire management zones that we would like to reduce the fire frequency and intensity, this is mainly on our basalt soils. What we are seeing there is that there's, uh, we're having a negative effect on our tall trees because of the increase in elephant utilization on these trees on our basalts. Um, as I showed you, when there is an uh, elephant impact, when we get our high intensity fires uh, on the basalts, and these areas that have a high elephant impact and our tall trees are, um, you know, they are stripped and their bark is uh, ex stripped and cambium exposed. When you have frequent high intensity fires, you then kill the tall tree with fire as a secondary impact. So we will still like to have fire in those landscapes, but we would like to have cooler, lower frequency fires in those landscapes just to remove the moribund grass and provide fresh new grazing Um, but we don't want high intensity, frequent fires. And we're seeing on our basalts, we're getting that because of fires coming in from um, um, Mozambique. So the idea for our, on our basalt soils, that's on our Eastern side, we need to have lower frequency and lower intensity fires, meaning we need to have more early season fires there. But on our granites, and especially in the Pretoriscope area or the Southern high rainfall, Sauerfeld areas, we want frequent high intensity fires for two reasons. Um, the vegetation, the so, um, sorry, the grass in that area needs to be burned because nothing eats touching grass once it's grown out. So we want to have that area burned frequently. And we're seeing an extensive amount of bush thickening and encroachment taking place in that area. So we would like to, and this is by indigenous vegetation. So we would like to use fires on a scale of 
much larger scale other than what um, manual removal can do to have uh, to try and open up that landscape. So those are the reasons why we would like to have different fire regimes, frequency and intensities in those areas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Navashni. A, a nice short one from Moira. Uh, a question is, what is meant by the fire return ratio? Fire return interval or fire frequency is how, how often a fire burns in that area. So you can have a, a high fire return interval. That means it burns once or two times uh, every year or uh, annually or every two years. Or you can have a long fire return interval where it burns very infrequently. So it burns every 10 years or 15 years. That's the meaning of fire return interval or fire frequency. Uh, still, with, uh, still with Facebook, Nabashni, um, there was a question uh, posed by um, Alex. Uh, and his question was, what sort of technologies does Kruger National Park use for fire monitoring? Uh, and uh, I'm not sure what it means. I'm sure you all know. He uh, asked, uh, do you use UAVs, thermal cameras, etc.? Yeah, UAVs. Un, unmanned uh, drones, basically, so with thermal cameras. So on the scale of the Kruger National Park, that won't be uh, be possible to use a drone to map uh, fires for the whole Kruger National Park, but we use similar technology from satellite images. So the same thing that you can put on a, a, a thermal camera on um, a drone or a UAV, they've got the same technology on satellites, and that's what we are using. So we're using the same technology, uh, but or at a much bigger scale. So we use the MODIS satellite imagery to map our fires. So that has been one of the biggest advancement in, in um, technologies is the capability of monitoring and mapping our fires that has changed over the past few decades. Uh, we've done various uh, other technologies that's using is in terms of fire weather and calculations of FDIs. And then very recently we started lighting fires from doing aerial ignition. So that's another way that we can increase the area burnt and stuff. So the use of technology in fire management in Kruger has advanced a lot and we are trying to uh, embrace as much as we can in the park. Thanks. Thank you, um, thank you Navashni. Um, another question, it's actually two, two and one. The, the first part is how many square kilometers are burnt each year in Kruger? And do sand parks use fire as a management tool in other national parks? Okay, so in, gosh, in, in, in terms of square kilometers, let's see. So what you must real, uh, what I would like to stress is there is no average value that's given how much we burn. As I said, the amount that is burnt in a particular fire scene is really dependent on how much rainfall falls in the previous two years. So when you have a wet year, which is like now, this year, you can get as much as 20% of the park burning. And that's what we're aiming for this year is 20% of the park almost burning because that's the amount of fuel that is available to burn. What does that translate to? Um, I'm not sure about square kilometers, but it's a few hundred thousand hectares that we can burn. But in the dry year, like in 2000 and, um, uh, three or the 2015, 2016 drought, um, we can get less than 1% of the park burning. So it's really dependent on what is the rainfall the previous two years. And that translates into how much fuel there is or grass growth, and therefore how much we can burn, uh, the relationship between rainfall and, 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 and how much we need to burn. Sorry, the, the second question oh, was, uh, is fire management used in other parks? Yes, it is. Um, a parks that do allow for uh, fire to be a very predominant driver, like Table Mountain National Park, the um, other savannah parks, our Grassland Park, Golden Gate, Marikele. Uh, these are the parks that fires, they do have fire management plans and strategies in order to use fire as a management tool. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I see there's still uh, quite a number of participants uh, in, in on the webinar, so we're going to carry on with the questions, and there That's are some fine. quite interesting ones as well. There are uh, they, they were a few uh, comments made uh, regarding the the input you gave on 
using eucalyptus and pine mm -hmm. for harvesting. And questions uh, were asked, they're not indigenous, they, they burn extremely hot, they use up a lot of water, and maybe, maybe you can just clarify that for us. So yes, these are these uh, the bond challenge or the UN tr trillion tree campaign AFR 100, where Africa has committed to 100 million hectares by 2030 of uh, contributing to the uh, carbon sequestration project. So this is where uh, countries are paid to reforest areas in an effort to be a carbon sink uh, for um, for in in support of. Uh, reducing our carbon emissions. So, so, the, so this is what's happening. So it is thought that trees are the best absorbers of carbon and therefore we need to plant more trees so that we can take more carbon out of the atmosphere and therefore we will have a reduced climate change effect. But we are seeing that actually woody vegetation is not the best storage or carbon sequestration uh, product out there. It's the soil. There's a lot of carbon that's stored in the soil and that needs to be looked at. But what are these programs are advocating is that we plant these trees and rehabilitate these areas and we plant them with eucalypt and pine trees because these are fast growing trees. No one wants to plant a tree that grows indigenous vegetation that takes 60 years to grow because then you're not going to be able to meet your carbon sequestration targets. But as we know, and in South Africa, we're seeing that these are not the best species to plant in areas for the reasons it has been given. Uh, they do affect the water table, they increase our fire intensities and frequencies in areas. But this, these are the discussions and the debates that we need to have. And the science is really trying to challenge these programs. But it's also a game where we have to now influence the political sphere, because the decisions are being made in, in those areas and in those arenas. And this is where the science really needs to play a role in influencing these decisions that are being made. So, we are trying to do that. I think there is a big um, a South African contingent with the global people, uh, researchers, and a lot of people working in Kruger National Park that's trying to um, address these concerns because one of the biggest things that comes out is like areas such as Kruger National Park and the Serengeti is actually considered to be degraded and therefore needs to be rehabilitated. And how would planting of trees? But we are trying to say that savannas and grasslands are just as important. And although they have the climate potential to support trees, they may not necessarily be able to do that because of the role of fire and the animals and the grazing and stuff. So that's what we are trying to, uh, to have an influence on in that debate. Thank you. Thank you, Navashni. Um, yes, there they were quite a number of questions about um, slow moving animals, pangolins, and I think you've, you've basically answered that question. There is a, a, a quite a long question. I'm going to read it to you, coming from Christine Christine Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. uh, webinars have pointed out the destruction that elephants have had on trees, with the result of loss of other species due to the loss of trees and vegetation, resulting in grasslands. It looks like fires have the same results. Surely we need to keep the typical bushveld vegetation to accommodate all browser species, or is sand parks wanting to increase grasslands in Kruger? Yeah. So, That's um, yeah, but we need to, well, how do you tackle an elephant is bite by bite. So let's do that. Um, so we need to, um, Sandfox does not want to have just grasslands. That's for sure. We want to have a savanna, especially in Kruger. We are in the savanna biome. And therefore, we need to have this balance between trees and grasses. But what we are seeing is that balance is now tipping towards bush encroachment or woody vegetation. We, it's proven. We've, we've shown it. We can just look at aerial photographs, you know, from the earlier on. We can see that's what the vegetation was like, grasslands, but an open grassland that's now these areas are becoming more wooded. So we are trying to get back to uh, an area that where we can have the savannas coexisting with these trees and grasses in uh, uh, playing a role in, in, in the system. In terms of uh, using fire and losing trees due to fire, remember we, I said that a, a healthy, tall savanna trees that is out of the fire trap more than three meters tall with normal fires, when I say normal, low intensity, cooler fires, which have been set under 
uh, more frequent fires where it's not this buildup of fuel, uh, these trees would have survived. Fire would have gone through them and would not have been uh, damaged the trees because these trees are fire adaptive. They have bark, they have aerial trips out of the fire trap. So they would have survived. Indeed, when you have the impact or elephant utilization of these trees, bark stripping, uh, breaking of the bark and stuff, and you expose the cambium and the tissue in there. That's when you have fire going in and fire will kill a, a savanna tree if, if it's out of the fire trap, if it is a secondary impact and if there's an initial um, utilization or elephant impact usually. So yes, that's why we say that we need to have a fire policy and uh, elephant management policy that comes together because there is this very, very strong interaction between these two drivers. So no, we're not, move, we're not wanting to move to more grasslands because we do understand that trees are important for the landscape, but we also don't want an area that is bush encroached or out competing your grasses. And that's why we need to have uh, a balance or have these uh, drivers um, equally playing a role. Thanks, Navashni. Uh, that just illustrates the, the complexity of your job. I certainly don't want it. Uh, best of luck with that. There was a question from Marty. Uh, her question is, uh, what about commercial sustainable gathering of grass and invader woody species as alternative to fire? Have you ever considered that? Yes, I mean, we would love to do that. Uh, the one program that we have is, uh, uh, well, we've tried a few times, but it has, we need to pick it up again, is having uh, communities come in and do thatch harvesting. You know, in the Pretoriskov area, the southern granites, uh, southwest granites in the park is where we get all our thatching grass and we use that resource in the park. So yes, we would like to, we do have programs that will allow communities to come in and they harvest the thatch and essentially they sell it back to us. And that's a, a, a resource use program that we have running. So that's one way that we can do. But you know, you, you're talking about the scale of the Kruger National Park and such a project doesn't really have an impact on the, uh, doesn't really have an impact to reduce the fuel load to an extent that we would like to. So I would think really this harvesting of wood, taking off uh, the fuel through that way and even uh, the grass as well through harvesting projects works in much smaller scales. But here we're talking about hundreds of hectares, if not thousands of hectares, and then tens of thousands of hectares. So the scale of Kruger really cannot um, warrant manual removal. It's thing, things like using a mechanical clear, clearing to, to, to reduce bush thickening. Absolutely, I think on smaller reserves, game farms, that is a very uh, viable option. But for Kruger, it's really not because of the sheer scale of the Kruger National Park and the size of the park. Um, Penny Abbott, uh, her question is, do um, the surrounding private reserves use the same fire policy? If not, does this have an effect on KNP? So the surrounding private reserves, um, we that's why fire protection associations, these have been instrumental and really important in getting people with different land use and different objectives with fire coming together and talking about fire and agreeing to how to manage fires in an area. So we have the Greater Kruger Fire Protection Association. It's the largest one in the country. And together with the surrounding private reserves as well as private landowners who have a common land use join this association and we manage fire together. So in the sense that they know what we are doing, they may not apply the same fire management policy because they have different objectives that they would like to achieve with their management. But we do talk the same language with fires. We do have fire security, safety, have fire breaks, have the same, uh, have good uh, equipment. And it's this col collaboration, we share resources. So it's fire protection associations that has allowed us to do this. And I think that has been very good legislatively that have been uh, implemented in South Africa. Thank you. Another another interesting question: Mupani can be invasive. Uh, can can uh, can fire control help to uh, to contain uh, Mupani encroachment? Mupani, yeah, that's something is uh, that's a species by itself. We're still trying to understand that. So, 
we, um, I mean, Mopani is not really an encroacher in, 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 in Kruger. So we have the Schaubfeld Mopani, which is actually the unique biome in the Kruger National Park. It doesn't occur anywhere else in, in South Africa. And therefore, we should be protecting that as much as we can. Uh, but um, the, the, the species that we will try to tackle with fire is, uh, is sicklebosch, so the Dicrostacus in the Kruger Park, as well as Combretums, and we would like to look at then Terminalia, the silver cluster leaf. So yes, fire can be a tool. Um, other species in areas, um, your invasive species such as uh, Chromolina, so fire has been used very successively in reserves in KwaZulu Natal to address Chromolina. We don't have that in Kruger. And so, yeah, we don't use fire to address chromalina, but yes, fire can be used as a, a tool to address invasive species. Roshni, thanks. Um, I, I'm gonna, there's still one or two more questions in, in the lineup. Uh, the one is don't, uh, it's maybe this is not to do with fire, but I think it's a very interesting question. Don't porcupines have the same effect as elephants on tree vulnerability to fires by stripping bark near tree roots. And it comes from uh, Charles Day. Yes, we've seen that in KZN, Shushlui and Fulosi, when I was there, it was really interesting that, uh, especially on your um, Tambuti trees and stuff. So yes, they do have a similar effect, but I'm not sure to the degree of the actual, their, their impact is, but they do, they because they do, um, uh, strip the bark and stuff and yes so yes it can have an effect especially if you have a lot of porcupine and have an impact on an area because then fire as a secondary impact can then kill those trees and another interesting uh, question slash statement from Llewellyn Taylor um, Navashni uh, he basically uh, his question is about he says, surely the vastly increased elephant population relative to stay in the years of active elephant number management in the past has necessitated the change in burning philosophy and program. Uh, maybe you would like to comment on that. Yeah, so as you said that, yes, one of the reasons why we say that elephant utilization, their browsing that they uh, they do take place and, and have an impact on the woody vegetation and fires a secondary impact will kill the tree, the tall trees. So indeed with an increase in elephant numbers, we see an increase in the impact and we're seeing that on our basalts and therefore we are saying that's why we would like to change the fire uh, regime frequency and intensity on these areas. So that's one ecological reason why we would like to change the fire frequency and intensity the other one is we are seeing bush thickening taking place and therefore we would like to increase the fire frequency and intensity. So uh, your statements that an increase in elephant utilization has necessitated change in the fire policy and yes, it has, that's for sure. And we are adapting to that. Thanks. Thanks Navashni. One last question and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna close off with, uh, with a final comment. Um, the question, uh, Lynn McEwen, uh, her question is, could you please name those three carbon sequestration programs again? Uh, it's the Bond Challenge, B-O-N-N. -N, that's the one. Uh, it's the AFR 100 program. That's very much an African uh, contribution to that or commitment to the Bond Challenge. And the third one was the UN Trillion Tree Campaign. So those are the three uh, programs that are advocating for um, rehabilitation and restoration uh, with trees. And we're not saying that these programs are wrong, please, but I think, uh, please understand me. They, we say that we need to look at where they're advocating for this rehabilitation to take place. So in the right places, yes, your urban areas, that's where you need to have uh, restoration and tree planting take place. So let's look at where we need to do the rehabilitation and restoration. And then secondly, what species we are using. And at the moment, it is eucalypts and pine that has been advocated and we're not agreeing with that. So let's try and use more indigenous species to try and re uh, to rehabilitate areas if there is a need to do that. So I think there are nuances to these programs that needs to be addressed, but it is not like the, the program we, we is, is wrong. So please 
uh, don't misunderstand me. Yeah, thanks, Nandavashni. That was uh, the last question. I just would like to make a comment. Uh, there were so many compliments given to you, and I think this one, uh, this one actually sums it up very nicely. And it says here, it's really awesome that we have such competent people looking after our natural treasures. Thank you for your passion and your commitment to take care of, uh, of our natural, natural resources. And with that, uh, Peter, I'm going to hand over to you. And thank you very much, Navashni, for answering all our questions in a, in a, in a very good, uh, good manner. Thank you. Th thanks, Vili. Thank you for taking that, that task on. Um, there are, the, I am, for those of you who've asked questions, I am going to send the Q&A list through to Navashni. So if yes, your question you. didn't get answered, hopefully Navashni will find time in a very busy schedule to uh, to do that for you. And and from from all of us, Navashni, thank you for absolutely boggling our minds with so much information and so many facts, some of which I think were probably sitting in the back of our minds, but we didn't uh, consciously remember them all, but there certainly is a lot of information and I think very few people even realized the, uh, the relationship between elephants and fires and trees and things like that. So it certainly, as Willie said, a very complex subject. So from all of us, thank you very, very much for your time and the effort that you've put into this presentation for us and all those wonderful concise answers. And to everybody who joined us tonight, thank you, thank you very much for joining us. Right, for those of you who aren't honorary rangers, we are volunteers. We all volunteer our time, our effort, um, our motor vehicles to drive around and do things. Um, so, we, and, and we buy all sorts of equipment that um, the rangers need. I'm sure that some of the backpacks and probably radios and all sorts of things that Navashni's crews use, some of them have been been bought by us and, uh, and donated to, to Kruger Park and, and to parks in general. Um, Sandparks gives us a wish list every year of um, equipment that's needed, stuff that's vital, tents, water bottles, boots, all sorts of things. So we would really appreciate any donations which help towards buying those things. And um, as I say, we're, we're volunteers. We don't get paid for it. We put our own time and effort into it. So we do appreciate every single cent that, that can be donated to us. And once again, from me, thank you very much for, jo for joining us. You will get um, an email from us about uh, World Ranger Day and um, all our other um, webinars as we plan them through the year. Um, and once again, thank you. Thanks to Navashni. She actually broke a record. We had more people registered to registered for tonight's webinar than we've ever had in the in the last year that we've been broadcasting them. So once again, from the Honorary Rangers, thank you, Navashni. Thank you for the team behind us. And thank you to everybody who joined us tonight. Thank you. And hopefully we'll see you soon. Keep well and keep safe. Thank you. Good night.